try to play it, but you're never gonna beat me Look the other way, what I'm doing ain't easy Bloody hands stain from the people who deceive me Muddy hands break through the chains, go free me Looking for change, looking for pain Pulling a mob, pushing a train I'll never stop, stick to a lane Hello there, it's me, Hookshot Drew, and our goal here at Superb Sports Media is to continue to deliver informative videos on the sports we love. Basketball is my favorite sport, we love that and its evolution to the high octane, energy injecting, chaotic excitement it has become today didn't happen overnight. Our story today concerns one that many saw as a black eye on the sport as it happened, the 1951 college basketball point shaving scandal. This little-known controversy, at least by modern basketball fans, opened the floodgates of cleaning up collegiate sports from outside influences and blew the lid off organized crime's involvement into the world of sports betting, particularly in the New York City market at the time. Now, some of you might be thinking, what does this have to do with the NBA since I don't usually cover college sports? Well, you see a lot, actually. Professional basketball was far from the revenue-generating juggernaut it is today during this time. A lot of high-level basketball players chose to follow different career paths during this time due to other occupations offering far more lucrative earning potentials. Nate Holman was a Hall of Fame basketball player from the early barnstorming days. The days of traveling competition worked similar to circus shows. Teams would travel to different cities and draw crowds to watch them take on their local teams in exhibition games. This was long before the days of television, so this is the best way to get your eyes on top-level talent in a given sport. As part of the original Celtics, who have no relation to the Boston Celtics, Holman built himself a name in the traveling act with his exceptional passing ability and floor leading skills. While making a name for himself with his innovative playing style and big brain playmaking ability, he was named coach of the CCNY basketball team in 1920, although he continued to play pro basketball for another 10 years while coaching the team. City College of New York was a strong school for collegiate sports in the New York City area and became a powerhouse in the late 1940s, in no small part to its great recruiting class. In 1948, the school recruited Ed Roman, Ed Warner, Alvin Roth, and Floyd Lane, who would comprise four-fifths of the team's starting five in the campaign of 1949-50. to It was Holman's assistant coach, Harold Sand, that recruited most, if not all, of the 49-50 CCNY Beavers men's team. This was long before college teams were recruiting players from all over the nation. This team was constructed from the city of New York itself, targeting prominent local high schools. It was with this local homegrown team that the CCNY men's team accomplished unprecedented history. Although CCNY's basketball program was rising through the ranks heading into the 49-50 season, they weren't chosen as a top 20 team by the AP or any other polling paper at that time. Despite going 17-5 in that season, the team's starting five only featured one senior, with the four other players being first-year eligible sophomores, as during this time, freshmen weren't eligible to play. The team was one of the last invited to the prestigious NIT tournament. Many newspapers didn't respect the young Beaver team, but that changed quickly, as the opening round of the NIT had the young CCNY squad facing the defending NIT champions, San Francisco. The game wasn't close nearly from the opening tip and CCNY won by 19 points. However, in the following round, the CCNY squad had their hands full with the legendary Kentucky men's team coached by Adolf Rupp, who was known to be a very brash and prejudiced man, famously declaring that Kentucky's teams would never feature a black player. The ethnically diverse CCNY team, however, featured three Jews and two black players in their starting five. Coach Holman had something up his sleeve to motivate his team to beat the heavily favored Kentucky team. He had them attempt to shake the Kentucky's team during pregame, knowing full well they wouldn't. The reaction angered and inspired the CCNY men's team, and from the opening tip, they dominated the Kentucky Wildcats men's team. When that final whistle sounded, the CCNY men's team won by 89-50, to handing the Rupp-led Kentucky team its worst ever in his very long storied tenure. To put that into context, how monumental this upset was, Kentucky won the NCAA championship in 1948, 49, and 51, all over the years surrounding this one. Riding high after beating Kentucky, the CCNY team had immeasurable confidence and made quick work in the semi-round to get to that championship round against Bradley. The Beavers relied on tournament MVP Ed Warner to overcome the All-American duo of Paul Unruh and Gene Squeaky Melichor. After winning the NIT tournament, basketball's most prestigious championship at the time, and New York's biggest revenue-generating sporting event each year, the CCNY squad were something of local celebrities. 
There was, however, very little time to enjoy it, as in just a few days, the NCAA tournament would begin, and being the NIT champions, CCNY had a spot in the tournament. At this time, the NCAA tournament was a smaller bracket than it is in modern times. There were two regions, with four teams each, meaning there was only eight teams in total in the tournament. This time, the CCNY men's team wouldn't have an easy time in the opening round against Ohio State and narrowly won on a free throw by the only senior in the team, Erwin Dambrot. Against North Carolina State in the following round, CCNY narrowly won 78-73 to set up a rematch in the finals against who else? Bradley. They defeated Bradley again, 71-68, blowing the roof off Madison Square Garden as the underdog local CCNY team had delivered basketball's first and only Grand Slam season to the city. The CCNY men's team had done it. CCNY basketball squad of 4950 accomplished something that had never been done before or since and will now never be done again. As the NIT changed their rules on allowing teams to compete in both tournaments shortly after that, winning both the NCAA tournament and NIT tournament in the same season, beating Bradley, a very powerful program both times, Adolph Rupp in Kentucky, it was certainly a Cinderella story and something for the city of New York to be proud of. However, something had been brewing in the northeastern side of the country for a while in collegiate sports. Gambling. With the uptick in the public betting on sports and the organized crime world having their grips on it, collegiate sports quickly became compromised, following in the footsteps of professional boxing and baseball from years before, and quite possibly since. Even in the 1950s, Madison Square Garden was the most famous sports arena in the world, and was a hot venue for locals looking to spend a night in the town. It was also the most popular place for illicit deeds, gambling very much included. Gambling was becoming so prevalent in the city at this time that spectators would often bemoan referee calls if it affected the point spread, often making bystanders laugh, as they all understood what he meant. As organized crime continued to power grab, they quickly began to run more gambling rings, using their influence to affect games. A plot quickly unraveled involving several schools, mostly in the NY area, but it also affected schools like University of Kentucky. And at the middle of the plot, the CCNY basketball team was involved. Now, the involvement of each player and staff ranged from point shaving to outright fixing games. Most players were bribed to point shave and that they were encouraged to sandbag and keep the scores close to bet alongside the spread. If a team were, for instance, favored by 4.5 points, a bookie might bribe a player on the favored team to keep the game close. Okay, now that we're caught up on all this so far, let's stop. Let's step out of ourselves for a minute here and try to place ourselves in 1950 post-war America, specifically New York City. Let's try to visualize growing up in one of the most famous yet crowded cities in the world. Let's imagine ourselves as a player on the CCNY team, whether that be a Jew or a black player. Now the backdrop around us. We grew up humble, but now we're revered by the kids as sports heroes. The adults respect us as local kids doing great things for the community, and everywhere we go, we're greeted and talked about. But at the same time, it's still New York City, and the reality is money is short. Everyone in the Big Apple has a score they're looking to make, and sports are no different. It almost feels like everyone is making money from us playing basketball, except us, the ones actually playing basketball. We get approached by a nice enough person that offers us $1,000. Remember, this is 1950, and they're offering it up front, with the only instructions being, keep it close within five. It makes us hard to turn down the temptation, especially when betting is being normalized as everyday chatter, even if the legalities are iffy. New York City in this time was about skirting the line between doing what's right and what might be against the law. Did these guys know how immoral and how deceitful their actions were? Possibly, but how can we know for sure? Look, I'm not here to advocate for or against gambling. That's not the point I'm making at all. And I do think athletes betting on their games is completely wrong. But there was a lesson to be learned here. And I think we've only just now seemed to slowly realize it. If college athletes are able to move this much money around, Who's to say they don't deserve to profit from it, since they're the ones putting in the hard work and generating enough interest that people are willing to lose their hard-earned money betting on it? Now I'll get off my soapbox now. I think I've made my point clear enough. Now once again, there were differing levels of game fixing going around, but the general consensus was that most players involved in the scandal stayed on point shaving, which is where the CCNY men's team fell. Perhaps the most interesting thing to me is how the scandal broke open. A player came forward from Manhattan College that was offered money to fix a game, but declined and told his coach about it. His coach told him to tell the DA about it. 
The district attorney then began poking around and was given the barest of tips about a former college player. It took a passing glance at him before it was quickly realized they might have had a strong lead after all. This former player was apparently tight with several interesting characters in the criminal underbelly, and using his status as a former player, was able to parlay those relationships into a point-shaving operation, in which he was able to talk players to gauge their interest in taking bribes. Some jewelry store owner he made connections with also had dubious ties. He would then move in and offer cash up front to fix these games. Detectives began following around the former player, and they slowly began to build up names of players he would frequently visit over the ensuing months, which happened to include four of the players on the CCNY men's team. It didn't take long before warrants and arrests were made. The CCNY men's team were discovered to have point shaved several games in the 48-49 season, but also a few regular season games in the 49-50 championship winning season as well. They found no evidence that the team shaved in any of the tournament games. If that's some kind of consolation, I'm not sure. The CCNY men's team went from being one of the greatest underdog and sports legends ever to disgrace nearly overnight. The findings angered the sports world and caused huge ripple effects. Immediately, punishments were handed out, including jail time, suspended sentences, and permanent bans from the fledgling NBA. Sweeping changes to the NIT and NCAA tournaments also occurred, including the aforementioned rule change that teams cannot compete in both. Madison Square Garden itself didn't host the NCAA tournament for several decades. All schools involved were harshly sanctioned, with Kentucky taking a one-year suspension and all other schools being dropped down to Division III, including CCNY that to this day remains in Division III. CCNY made major budget cuts to their athletic department, especially when news that a couple of their basketball players weren't even eligible and that their entrance exam results were considered dubious at best. The NIT itself went from being the more important tournament to the consolation tournament, with no NCAA tournament participants being invited at all. New York, the city that was the capital of basketball, took a big, long-lasting hit when this happened. New York was and still is holy ground for the game of basketball, and in this era, basketball thrived. Many fans of basketball from this era believed that the best college players of the day were better than the pro basketball players, as a lot of the best college players pursued better careers due to the relatively low pay of pro basketball. A lot of the players involved with the scandal went on to have successful careers out of basketball. In that respect, at least they were able to learn from this and still have a successful life. But one has to consider what players like Erwin Dambrot, Sherman White, Ed Warner, and Alex Groza could have done in the early days of the NBA. As a matter of fact, Alex Groza, a Kentucky Wildcat, and one of Adolf Rupp's best players, did indeed play two NBA seasons before the scandal broke out, and the NBA banned him for life before his third season began. In those two seasons, Groza was an All-NBA first-team player both times, and battled with a guy named George Mikan for top of the scoring chart, as both he and Mikan were the only ones to score over 20 points a game during this time. Groza and others like him made an unfortunate mistake that changed the course of basketball history but it also taught an important lesson. Do not tarnish your legacy for a quick buck. But at the same time, another lesson that wasn't immediately obvious for a long time was also there to be learned from. College players who draw crowds and bring big money and interest to the game should probably be paid too, as it hardly seems fair that all parties involved except the players could profit from their hard work. I believe history is to be learned from, and no doubt this point in history can absolutely be learned from. A group of unlikely guys, the last guys you'd pick to win, accomplished history that almost no one remembers, simply because they made a life-changing mistake. We must remember that those that came before us, the good and the bad and everything in between, so that we can progress and be overall better for it. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like this video. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss more videos about our favorite sports past. Feel free to comment your opinions, feedback, or anything else you'd like to share. I am Hookshot Drew, and be sure not to miss our next video about basketball storied history. I left a breadcrumb as to the video topic in this video. Let's see if anyone can figure it out. See you soon.